So, good morning, good noon, good afternoon, good evening to everybody all around the world. I am Dr. Cameron Nejad. I would like to welcome you to another session of the Worldwide Endo March for the benefit of the young girls and women with endometriosis and their families all around the world. We would like to thank all of you for tuning in and listening. And we would like to thank all of our patients, our friends, the organizers of the Worldwide Endo March, the ambassadors, the captains, the presidents of the each chapters around the world that since the inception of the Worldwide Endo March seven years ago have significantly raised awareness about endometriosis and they have brought endometriosis more and more to the forefront for the helping of millions and millions of women and young girls with endometriosis around the world. So we would like to thank you very, very much. These sessions, as you know, they have been very successful and very popular, and it is all because of you. Please let us know what you would like to hear and what sessions and write your questions. We would uh, announce them and we would uh, answer those questions. Before we start, we would like to address a couple of very popular questions that often people are asking us. The next webinar would be in August, August the 29, and the issues that we will address, they are going to be about adenomyosis and fibroids and their relationship also with endometriosis. And if you have any questions specifically about fibroid, endometriosis, adenomyosis, that it is very common with endometriosis, and any other specific question that you might have, we would try to address them again. It is going to be Saturday, August the 29th. Also, many of you around the world have you been asking questions about the next year worldwide end of March. Yeah, next year, Worldwide End of March is going to be during the weekend of March 26th to 28th, and it is going to be virtual, and we will announce it later how all of you across the globe, we will feature you, and we, you have time to present your achievements in your country, in your area, during these two days of live session, virtual, that we will organize it. So that is another announcement that I would like to make. And, and finally, I'd like to thank today's participants, our wonderful patients, and Lily Cooper and her mother, Karen Zeltzer. Also, we would like to thank Marketa, Janska with her daughter Stella and her husband Ryan, that they are two of our patients that they are going to uh, express their journey and their experience with endometriosis and their travel with endometriosis. And of course, the uh, Dr. Sarah Brucker from Germany, uh, that uh, she has been very kind she is a leader in endometriosis and congenital abnormalities of the female reproductive organs. And in Germany, she is the head of her department. She has joined us. And also we have Dr. Dorian Bosev, the professor at the University of Sofia in Bulgaria, that he has done a lot of work, research about endometriosis, and he is going to address that. We would like to thank them. Also, we would like to thank our own uh, organizers at the Worldwide Endo March headquarters, uh, Zoe Pennington, Sean Stetner, Eliza, and in New York, Tiffany, 
that they have been very helpful with uh, running the uh, Worldwide Endowatch. The founders of Worldwide Endowatch, Dr. Bar Sina Nijad, Dr. Azad Nijad, myself, and Barbara Page. Also, we would like to thank you for all of your attention and participation for in this series. Saying so, we thought this time we start. There are several questions in respect to uh, endometriomas and chocolate cysts and how uh, uh, to deal with it. At the same time, uh, how uh, women get pregnant and have children, patients who have had endometriosis and chocolate cysts and endometriomas, failed IVF. So each of them, we, I thought we asked uh, Marketa to say a little bit of her journey. Marketa is one of our patients, and I let her tell her story. And then after that, we will proceed with question and answers about uh, some of the uh, questions. And then after that, Lily would say something and then some question and answers. So Marketa, are you available to say something? with your little daughter. Yes, hello. My name is Marketa Janska and this is Estella. She's 10 and a half months old. And um, my journey um, to conceive was, it was difficult. We, we got married, me and my husband got married in 2012 and um, didn't start trying until th 2015, but um, uh, it took us about eight months to of unsuccessful of being unsuccessful to go to a fertility clinic and <coughs> oh is this gonna be <laughs> she's a twin um we we did um in a fertility clinic we did uh, six iuis in the beginning which took around seven months <coughs> and then i did ivf um <coughs> and when i had <coughs> when i had um we were lucky to get to um a couple embryos and uh i was supposed to do the transfer but i wasn't confident about my uterus because by that time i was in such pain um during my period and also during my treatment i felt like my uterus was just burning inside it was just such a burning sensation and i wasn't confident about in um doing the transfer with my embryos and i asked my fertility doctor dr back in california fertility partners if there's anything else i could test for or i was very scared of not being successful with the with the ivf with the embryos and she said i could do this uh, endometrial test which um, will find out like which will find out what the um, status of my and, and uh, my uterus is or i don't know how to describe it but um uh, i did the test and it came back a few weeks later that i have they have found the endometrial uh, cells in my uterus and that i have endometriosis and i never realized right i didn't know about it i had no idea um the only thing i knew was that i had really painful periods and yeah i just didn't know about it i guess my, i wasn't aware and um we uh, she recommended dr najat to um schedule us to, uh, to to have a consultation and schedule surgery and i had my surgery november 1st and i recovered very well it only took me a few days but it was pretty severe he told me that it was stage four and i had it all over my bladder and my ovaries in my uterus my rectum like basically all over and uh, he told me that we have a um great what was he saying we had a we have a great chance to, of, of conceiving and <laughs> and we did conceive our daughter naturally um month and a half after my surgery and which was a huge surprise and uh yeah, and here she is. So <laughs> we were very, very successful with Dr. Najat's help, and we're very, very, very grateful. Thank you very much, Estella. So, uh, Marketa and Estella and Ryan, <laughs> the issue is 
that we wanted to address is that a lot of times, young women with endometriosis, the question is how to diagnose endometriosis. And one of the goals of Worldwide Endomage has been to, to find a way to diagnose endometriosis and how to find out how endometriosis is diagnosed. Right, there are some tests coming up, and we are, uh, like Receptiva and some of the endometrial assays. But at the same time, we want to let you know, Worldwide Endomage has been able to develop an app that that app is completely free, and you can diagnose endometriosis with the uh, app of Endomage with more than 90% accuracy, and that is available. So thank you very much, Marketa, for your uh, experience and the issue of endometriosis and infertility. And here is our friend, the father, Ryan. Nice to see you, Ryan, with a baby. So. Uh, please don't uh, stay there. Some may have questions from you, and then uh, when there is questions from you, like the Sino, Parnesia, they will bring it up. So we will go, and there is one question that we would like Dr. Barker to address it is, do chocolate cysts affect the function of the ovary? There is, there is one question coming. Uh, Dr. Barker, as I mentioned, she is the head of the department at her a program in Germany, and uh, Sarah, it is welcome. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you, Marketa, also for sharing this, um, your history, because this is a very typical history, and the problem is that most of us as women have been told our long life that pain during our period is something normal. And I think it is very important, therefore, congratulations to the family, Nesat, for this awareness campaign that even young girls have not to be told that pain during the period or during sexual intercourse is something which you have to tolerate. And we have to look where is the balance between a really, really minor pain and where is the pain so severe that we have to think about endometriosis? And your story, your history really tells us that pain is one of the most things we have to look at, but also, and this was the question what Dr. Nessa just asked me, that um, of course, if there is a chocolate cyst on one side, you could assume that this affects the functioning of the ovary. But not only the chocolate cyst of the ovary could affect the fertility, it could also affect if endometriosis. And if it's only a minor endometriosis, we would like to have it cured and resected before we try to get a fertility treatment. Because what you told us is often the case that once you have cured endometriosis for the moment, women get pregnant one or two months later. So this is the good thing about endometriosis. You could cure it for a while and you could get pregnant. But of course, if you have an endometrioma, so-called chocolate cyst on one side, this affects the functioning of this ovary. Thank you very much, Dr. Barker. The next question comes from uh, uh, one of the patients who is from uh, Ireland. The question is, what are the signs and symptoms of bladder and ureter endometriosis? And that question is for Dr. Boza. Hello, Cameron. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Bosif. I do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can yes, come from Sofia, Bulgaria. It's a very interesting question because um, urinary tract endometriosis is very rare, and it actually presents in one to six percent of all women that are diagnosed with endometriosis. The thing is that in cases of ureteral endometriosis, the patient typically has pelvic lesion 
that uh, causes external compression, inflammation, and fibrosis of the involved ureter. The patient may present with vague symptoms that are not typical, like pelvic or back pain, renal colic, like uh, silent urinary obstruction with hydrouretor and loss of renal function. The genitourinary symptoms are flank or abdominal pain, dysuria, gross hematuria, uremia, and uh, pelvic mass. So, uh, in some cases, actually, the symptoms are more, uh, more common for endometriosis, like dysmenorrhea, pelvic pain, or uh, dyspareunia. Actually, the lack of overt symptoms of uh, endometriosis of the ureter makes sometimes this diagnosis very, very difficult. And although ureteral endometriosis, uh, the, although ureteral obstruction of um, <clears throat> ureteral endometriosis is an uncommon condition, it is very important to put the right diagnosis and treatment in order to avoid uh, the loss of renal function. On the other hand, unlike uh, ureteral endometriosis, bladder endometriosis is usually symptomatic. Patients typically present with low urinary tract symptoms. Um, including hematuria, dysuria, uh, suprapubic pain, increased uh, urinary frequency, and elevated intravesical pressure. Of course, this needs to be differentiated. What is the differential diagnosis of these conditions? Most probably, you have to do differential diagnosis with um, urinary tract infections, with uh, interstitial cystitis, with bladder stones or with menopause or with uh, <clears throat> neoplasms. So the, the, uh, the diagnosis of, of the ureter endo is sometimes very difficult because the symptoms are not typical, they are not clear. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bosov. So in summary, those of you that if you think there is endometriosis, if there is blood in your urine, or you have a lot of flank pain, then obviously you see an endometriosis specialist, they do a test, and they can evaluate your bladder and your kidney, usually with a CT scan, and sometimes ultrasound. So the next question is for Dr. Sinanejad, and when the chocolate cyst exists, there is a lot of controversy when to remove the chocolate cysts, when to not to remove them. So, uh, Dr. Sinanajad, when the question is, if there is a patient who wants to get pregnant, or if she doesn't even want to get pregnant, she has a chocolate cyst, when should it be removed, and sh when should it not be removed, and what are the consequences of that removal or not removing of the cyst? Thank you very much. Hello to everybody, all of our friends and patients and participants. And also I'd like to thank the panel for joining us. Now, ovarian chocolate cyst is a description by imaging. That's all. It's what how you look at things. But when there is a cyst in the ovary, something is not right. For example, Majority of the patients who do have chocolate cysts, they have extra ovarian endometriosis too. So, of course, there is low but potential risk of malignancy and other problems. When should it be removed? Depends on the experience and the skill of the surgeon and the patient's condition and her desire how to proceed. Risk factor, family history, these are all indication of endometriosis or cancer, etc. So it has to be individualized, evaluated. But I can address when it shouldn't be removed. That's the most important part that I address. A person who doesn't 
to read the ovary as a very delicate organ, that person should not remove the cyst. And the reason I'm re-emphasizing this, because unfortunately on the teaching, now they say ovarian cystectomy is an easy procedure and it's a teaching for the residents and the students. In my practice, it is completely opposite. Ovarian cystectomy requires the most experience of using microsurgical principle to avoid any damage to ovarian tissue and the follicles. I hope I addressed your question. Yes, thank you very much. So in summary, for the ovarian cyst, it has to be individualized. And we have to make sure that if it is treated, it is done by somebody who is experienced not to damage the ovary. The next question is for Dr. Brocker, that if, they pay, if, there is, if there is a chocolate cyst in one ovary, like the right ovary, and if the cyst, if the ovary, for example, in the right side has a chocolate cyst, is that cyst affecting the function of the ovary on the other side as well or not? That is the question for Dr. Brock. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Well, if you have a chocolate cyst on one side, as Sina Neset just told us, normally it's not the only place where endometriosis is going on. So normally if you have a cyst on the right ovary, which has endometrium in it, and you call it then chocolate cyst, you have to be very careful in looking around in the whole abdomen or pelvis if there are other endometriosis lesions. And it could, of course, be that there is endometriosis on the other side. But as Sinanessa told us, you have to handle the ovary very, very carefully and have to do a good, a perfect preoperative diagnosis. And ultrasound is one of the most important things you have to do before you go into surgery. And then you can see if there is a cyst on the other side. And sometimes it's only endometriosis on top of the other ovary, which you could remove or coagulate, which depends as well on the individual patient. So if you have a chocolate cyst on the right ovary, be aware that there could be endometriosis all over the abdomen, even if you go upper towards the liver or the peritoneum there. And you should remove it if the first thing or the prominent wish of the patient is to conceive and to get pregnant. The other thing is if she has pain as her main symptom. So you have to differ between those two things. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bracker. Uh, the question, the next question is for also for Dr. Bosev. Dr. Bosev, what is the most common area of endometriosis? Is it bladder more or the ureter more or the kidney? What is the incidence? Just tell us these three, uh, which one first, second, and third? In patients with urinary tract endometriosis, the bladder is the most commonly affected organ followed by the ureter and then comes the kidney uh, with uh, ratio estimated 40 to 5 to 1 or approximately more than more than 85 percent of the endometriosis of, is to the bladder and 14 and something percent to the ureter and less than one percent to the kidney thank you very much that is an excellent answer and very good her size, bladder, the most common, 85, and then ureter, 14%, and only 1% kidney. The question for Dr. Farnejat is, when you remove endometriosis, when you excise ovarian cysts versus when you ablate the ovarian cysts or other endometriosis, what is the risk of recurrence? And also, does the diet, like gluten-free diet, has anything to do and how could affect the rates of endometriosis? Uh, 
you have to, Dr. Panejad, you are muted. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. So the question has uh, two parts. Uh, one part is the incidence of the um, recurrence of the uh, endometriosis and endometrioma after the excision and ablation. And the other question is about the effect of the uh, gluten free diet. Overall, the incidence of the recurrence of the peritoneal endometriosis after complete treatment depends to several factors, including the patient's age, the severity of the endometriosis, and if the patient after surgical treatment received any hormonal suppressive therapy or not. Also, definition of the recurrence depends how you define it. If you define a recurrence of the symptoms like pelvic pain, or patient become again infertile, or surgically you do another laparoscopy, for example, to see if the endometriosis has come back. So it depends, as I said, how you define the recurrences. Thank you very much. So go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I just want to mention one more thing. One more thing was that also endometrioma, the original of this endometrioma, we have published a paper about it. Majority of this endometrioma coming from ovulation. That ovulation of the ovary combined with endometriosis on the surface of the ovary and on the pelvic side wall get together and makes it chocolate cyst or endometrium. So if the patient after the surgery receives ovulation induction medications like undergoing IVF or IUI and produces multiple ovulation cysts, these patients have higher chance of developing endometrioma compared to patients that does not want to get pregnant, and you put her on some kind of hormonal suppressive therapy like birth control pills and prevents her from ovulation, this patient will not develop endometrium. The last, the last part of the question about the diet, gluten-free diet, anything that decreases the inflammation could help the pain but not affects the recurrence of endometriosis. That is a short summary. Thank you very much, Dr. Farnajad. We appreciate it. The next question is, a patient is uh, said that she has had endometriosis, and that is for Dr. Brocker, the next question. She said she has had endometriosis removed from both of her ureters and she is concerned about monitoring the function of her ovaries, she, uh, ureters. She, she has heard that endometriosis of the ureter could cause silent loss of the kidney. And how should she be sure that her uh, ureter doesn't obstruct and she doesn't lose her kidneys? Yes, this, sir, uh, is indeed a question which a patient um, yeah, could, could ask, but if it depends on, on the surgery, of course. It depends on, on several things. If, for example, the surgeon is very excellent and could have removed the whole endometriosis around the ureter, and if, for example, they had to excise 
endometriosis of fibroid tissue around the ureter and do a reanastomosis. And if the surgeon can tell that there is no sign of endometriosis around in the whole pelvis or the abdomen, then normally the risk is very low. And it depends also on the age of the patient. So um, you could say, okay, um, if she is uh, in her 40s or mid 40s, you could put her on the uh, conceptive pill and then she could also have a minimal risk that endometriosis comes back. So it really depends on the patient and it depends especially on how good and how perfect the surgery was done so that there is no just superficial ablation of endometriosis, but really resective endometriosis done. And this must be, yeah, sure. And the patient has the right to ask her surgeon how we removed really the endometriosis. Thank you very much, Dr. Brocker. And that brings us to a very important aspect that, you know, endometriosis is very common and endometriosis when it is very severe it could be far worse than cancer when you dissect it when you resect very bad endometriosis when you want to treat it surgically bad endometriosis is more difficult than any cancer and often we were doing a, a procedure uh, on thursday with one wonderful colleague of mine an excellent colorectal surgeon uh, Dr. Cindy Kin, and we were removing endometriosis and we were resecting a bowel in a patient and we were discussing that this endometriosis could be worse than cancer in patient. And that is why you have to see an specialist familiar with endometriosis. And as Dr. Bracker mentioned, endometriosis of the ureter could, could cause silent loss of the kidney. And for you to make sure how you are not losing your kidney. Obviously, you have to be followed by the surgeon who did your surgery. And usually what we do in the very bad cases, we follow our patient by sometime yearly ultrasound, as it was mentioned, again, of the kidneys and the ureters, and sometimes a CT, depending how severe it was. And for now brings me to the next issue that I want to address, and I would ask Lily and Amon to chime in, is that a lot of time, even pain, and uh, it is not normal. It is, often we see young women in the office on a daily basis that they come and they say, well, Everybody, my, her mother, her doctor, her teacher, they say, well, you are a young girl and the pain is normal when you grow up. This pain is going to be, uh, when you get pregnant, when you have children, pain will be gone. And sometimes when you ignore the pain, it could get worse. And I'd like you to listen to one of the stories and share that, and that is going to be Lily and her mom, Karen. And we appreciate both of you being part of this panel. Please go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Lily Koopa and I am an 18 year old patient of Dr. Cameron Najat. I am chronically ill and one of the diseases I struggle with is endometriosis. My journey with endometriosis has been a long and a hard battle. And although endometriosis is very common as it affects between one and eight to 10 women, it often goes undiagnosed. And those seeking help are frequently dismissed. I began struggling with symptoms of endometriosis starting at the age of 14. I had immensely painful periods that were very heavy. I had daily migraines, brain fog, fatigue, insomnia, night sweats, dizziness, abdominal pain, GI issues, and urinary issues. During this period in constant pain with all these symptoms, my family and I had no idea what was going on. I saw three GI doctors, two gynecologists, a cardiologist, two primary care doctors, a hematologist, therapist, psychologist, and two sleep specialists before I was finally diagnosed three years later with endometriosis. 
During these three years, I was tested for very basic diseases through blood testing and easy visual exams. Because these doctors did not take my problem seriously, I was told the cause of all of my pain, all of my symptoms were anxiety. I was constantly told my pain and my symptoms were all in my head. I was told I needed to get help, that I needed to go to therapy, and that all of my problems would just go away. For three years, 1,095 days, I lived in horrible, debilitating pain, knowing that it was not all in my head. I missed hundreds of days of school. I missed social gatherings. I missed out on so much while at home, stuck in bed, doubled over in pain. My mom was spending hours researching possible causes and had to come up with endometriosis. While talking to her friend who had endometriosis about my symptoms, she said it sounded like endometriosis. Her friend had been a patient of Dr. Cameron Najat, and her friend had been a patient of Dr. Najat as a teenager and gave my mother his information. She made an appointment with him, and this sounds really cheesy, but my life changed, my world opened up, and my true journey began. I met with Dr. Najat. I sat in his office at his big table. I was very nervous and I expected that he would just tell me my pain was in my head and to go to therapy. But instead he said to me that my pain was real and that it sounded very likely that I had endometriosis. He did a vaginal ultrasound and it showed me that I truly did have endometriosis. He cleared his schedule and the following week, October 18th of 2018, I had my laparoscopy. The results showed that I had stage four endometriosis, that I was covering my bladder, my uterus, my rectum, and my bowel, and that my bowel had become attached to my cervix. It also showed that I had ad adenomyosis and cysts. This day proved that my pain was not and never was in my head. Dr. Najat was the first doctor who believed me and gave me a voice. Since this day, I have been diagnosed with seven other disorders, and I'll finally explain, explain all my symptoms that I started experiencing at the age of 14. The other disorders that I have been diagnosed with, along with endometriosis, are postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, complex regional pain syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, visceral ptosis, interstitial cystitis, pelvic floor dysfunction, and vulvodynia. Something that I have learned through this journey is that many other women who have endometriosis also have these other disorders, as they all connect in different ways. If you have one, you may be more likely to have another. Before I met Dr. Najat and was believed, I was in a very dark and deep, hopeless hole full of despair. After my diagnosis of endometriosis, I emerged from this hole with hope, with powerful information, and I found a community on social media of other girls with almost the exact same story as me, where they were not believed and their diagnosis was delayed years. I found light and passion in having a voice and spreading awareness, and since created an Instagram where I bring attention to these invisible illnesses like endometriosis, and I'm in the process of creating a blog. I hope to help other girls and women reach a place of acceptance of their disease, but not acceptance of their pain, a place where they can feel comfortable in their bodies and can strive and hope to do the best they can and feel like they are enough. I also plan to go to school to work in the medical field to give young girls a better experience from the beginning of their struggles to be heard and to be believed. I once saw doctor's offices and testing locations as a place of harm and as a place of trauma. Once I received my diagnosis and had a framework for understanding my body and my challenges, I can now work with doctors and be involved in the medical system armed with the right diagnosis and surgical reports to back it. I will no longer feel lost and disempowered Medication can now be helpful instead of a band-aid to some undiagnosed problem. Tests can give a possible answer. A doctor's office can be a place of support. I won't accept less and neither should you. I have many bad days. I still struggle with pain and challenges, but I am stronger and I feel better inside myself to get up every day and find something positive to hold on to. Today, this experience is one of those wonderful things to hold on to. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Lily, for your very courageous and for very kind uh, coming to this program and helping other young women, young girls that 
uh, they believe that it is not in their head and uh, and uh, there is help for them. Yeah. So I uh, thank you very, very much. That is, uh, I'm uh, glad you are doing much better. And Karen, how did you, what is this, or how, what is your experience? Please share with other mothers. Yes, um, and, and thank you very much again for this amazing opportunity. And I know that Lily is a voice for um, girls and women who have had endometriosis and I'm hoping to be helpful um, as a mom who was trying to navigate a medical system for my daughter when she was a young teenager. Um, I, I know that our journey is really not unique um, and that it's really much more of the rule and not the exception. Um, and I found that the road to being believed um, and being diagnosed and receiving proper treatment is ripe with medical trauma and one of the most powerful ways to heal from trauma is through connection and empowerment. Um, while I was watching my daughter suffer in horrible pain and have a multitude of different symptoms, um, I felt very alone and very powerless as I navigated a medical system that looked at each system, uh, looked at each symptom in isolation and would refuse to explore how all these different symptoms could be related. The usual response um, that we heard time and time again um, was that Lily would be routinely dismissed and that her symptoms would be minimized. Um, and as I took Lily from one doctor to another, uh, each would suggest that not only was this anxiety on her part, but perhaps this was all because I was an anxious mother. Um, they would be kind of begrudgingly give some treatment to target one symptom. And I continuously implore doctors uh, to, to try to connect the dots that I felt like there was really an underlying medical um, condition that was really at the root of all this that connect all these symptoms and could give a real explanation. Um, as a mom, I was routinely criticized and humiliated by doctors, um, by school administrators who would give me a look or a tone that I was a very permissive mother to allow my daughter to miss so many days of school while I knew she was at home, doubled up in bed in pain. Um, I had people who would be annoyed if I canceled plans because I didn't want to leave her alone. And I missed a lot of my own work, which left as a mom feeling like um, you could never do enough for, for everybody and that somehow I was failing everyone. Um, I found that uh, shame and guilt were feelings that plagued me, guilt that I couldn't protect my daughter from pain. I couldn't protect her from medical trauma with each dismissal, each emergency room fiasco, each negative comment um, that it was all in her head. But as a mom, as worn down as I was and dreading each doctor's visit, um, I knew that we had to go on and that I had to continue fighting and advocating for, for my child. I knew she wasn't making this up. I knew she wasn't exaggerating. I knew it wasn't in her head. Um, and then one day I Googled her current symptoms and up popped this word endometriosis. And I started to read about it as much as I could. And I thought, okay, this, this could be it. And I actually emailed all of the doctors involved with her care and suggested that this was at the root of all these symptoms and they all ignored me. Um, the final piece of the puzzle that allowed this puzzle, this, this uh, situation to be solved was an opportunity to speak at a conference, um, which unfortunately would take me halfway across the US. And I felt horrible mom guilt leaving my daughter um, back home in pain uh, when I traveled so far away. During the weekend, my co-presenter was privy to the many phone calls that I had with Lily, who kept reaching out to me in pain and wanting to talk to her mom. Um, she realized something wasn't okay at home, and she asked, and I answered, and I began to explain what Lily was experiencing and how hard it was to be away from her. She then said something pretty amazing. She said, that's exactly the story of my life as a teenager and began to explain her experience with endometriosis. She shared her journey. I asked a million questions. Um, and the most important question at the end was, uh, what is the name of your surgeon? As soon as I got back to the Bay Area from the conference, I called Dr. Cameron Najat's office and they were warm and welcoming and they scheduled our consultation. Um, walking into Dr. Cameron Najat's office, um, everything was different than all of our other experiences with doctors. He was warm, he listened, he told Lily that it was not in her head. That was one of the very first things he said. He said it was not anxiety. 
He encouraged her to have a voice in the office and he listened carefully. And he did something so giving and so generous. Um, and it was something that I didn't realize how much I needed, how badly I need it. He turned to me and said these wonderful words. He said, you are a good mother. Um, these words filled my soul. He showed caring for Lily and he validated her. And for the first time in years, I could breathe. I think I had been holding my breath all these years and now I could exhale knowing that someone was in charge, who was caring, who believed her and who could help and that I was no longer alone in this. I could just be mom instead of a full-time advocate and a full-time medical student at the online school of Google. I'll never forget when Dr. Najat came to me and my husband after Lily's surgery, immediately after her surgery, and told us that she had stage four endometriosis, that it was very aggressive for someone so young, and explained all the ways that it showed up wreaking havoc on her. He kindly suggested that I send surgical reports to all of the doctors that we had seen over the years to help educate them. I was very happy to send those emails. At first, I was very angry, um, thinking back to all the, the negative messaging that we had both gotten over the years. So I waited two weeks before I sent those emails out because I didn't want it to be a kind of revenge to those doctors who had been so wrong, so dismissive, so uneducated about women's health. I didn't want it to be, and I told you so. I knew that for my own healing, I needed it to come from a place of sharing knowledge and educating people who needed this education to prevent it from happening to any other young girl. Um, and that was the beginning of, of my journey to try to educate as many people as I could about my daughter's struggle and about all the millions of women and young girls across the world who have this uh, very challenging disease and have also a lot of medical trauma around not being believed for years. Um, I also love the opportunity to uh, empower and support Lily's voice that had been silenced and quieted for so many years. And we both feel that if telling one person can help them feel not alone and get the help that they need, this is really the silver lining. Um, and as I mentioned, the journey was ripe with medical trauma and healing has come rapidly for me as someone traumatized watching my daughter go through this process. And for Lily, Dr. Najat was really the beginning of healing of her body and her spirit and then the connection to the enormous online community was the next stage of her healing. She shared these links and these posts um, and I learned so much and I felt not alone and one, uh, one person involved in a fight, but as part of the many in this community. Uh, and today she is a part of this global community that supports, uh, educates and empowers one another and knowledge as we all know is indeed power. And I cannot thank enough the doctors involved today for educating um, so many people and also to thank the community that's um, uh, engaged in watching this because I know that you're not only here to gain knowledge to help yourself and help your loved ones, but also to spread the word and share this knowledge. Um, and so I no longer feel alone and powerless, guilty and full of shame, but proud and honored to be the mother of a daughter who is a fierce uh, and powerful endo warrior and I implore you all to keep up the fight and make yourself heard and advocate for yourself and your loved ones. And to remember that there are hard days and many hard days, uh, but when you are worn down, whether you're the patient or the mom or the caregiver or the family member, um, particularly if you're the patient, when you are worn down, please reach out to this amazing community um, that will always be there for you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. It's, it's been an amazing opportunity and a great honor. And um, yes, so thank you very much. No, thank you very, very much to you, Karen and Lily. It is uh, our pleasure and our privilege to have you. The issue that Karen and Lily bring up, it is not that medical community they you know they mean well they have good intentions the issue is that is why we like to thank Karen Lily and all the all of you the participant whoever is listening around the world especially the organizers of worldwide endomarch across the globe that you are trying to 
elevate the level of awareness. What it is not in your mind, eyes, your eyes don't see. It is not on the radar of many physicians about endometriosis, I and mean, it is not anybody's fault. It is so common that it has become part of the culture. But pain is not normal. They have been saying it for years. If it was normal, every 10 out of 10 women that had pain, but they don't. So it is a good idea to eva evaluate it. There is hope right now. And we are, uh, my yard is hard by inches a cinch. We are making progress that hopefully children of Lily and and the daughter of uh, Marquetta, Stella, they don't suffer. There are more in the future. Hopefully we will find there are scientists all around the world that are helping, as I mentioned. Good tests are coming up for diagnosis of endometriosis. And also we have, again, the app of the Advice Endomet Endomarch that could help those around the world. That is the free app that could help you diagnose endometriosis. And that brings me to next question to Dr. Sinanija. The question is, the patient is a 29-year-old woman. She has had infertility. She has had one miscarriage. She has very little pain, but she has a chocolate cyst. She has an endometrioma. She wants to know if she has this chocolate cyst, does it mean she has endometriosis anywhere else? If you have a chocolate cyst and you don't have any other symptoms, do you have to have surgery again? Or in this specific patient, can she get pregnant again? Or what do you recommend for her, please? Yes. Thank you very much. This is a great question. And I'd like to thank uh, Lily, Karen, and uh, I have good news for you. Professor Sarah Broker has done extensive work on adolescent endometriosis and also uh, anomalies associated with endometriosis. So there are many good doctors, not that the other doctors who didn't diagnose you are bad, but there are good doctors all over the world that they are advocating early detection and I personally have the most admiration for Professor Broker for all of the good work she has done for the young uh, patients. Now, to answer your question, I think if we play back what Marketa said with uh, Stella and we saw the result, that's the answer to your question, yes. Patients with endometriosis, even though they have had miscarriage or they may have difficulty getting pregnant, if they are appropriately treated, they have excellent chance of getting pregnant on their own. Back to your situation, I cannot make a specific recommendation without examining and thoroughly evaluating. But as Professor Baroka and myself who mentioned, when there is suspicion for endometrioma, there is a very high chance of having endometriosis in other area. And as we know, endometriosis is an autoimmune inflammatory process that could affect fertility significantly. So please discuss it with your doctors, make sure endometriosis is on the radar, but then when it comes to surgery, damage of the ovary could hamper fertility. So I would recommend if the surgery comes, please make sure the ovary is treated respectfully. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sinanajad. Then the next question is uh, for Professor Bracker in Germany that if an endometrioma uh, ruptures, is it going to cause more trouble and could it contaminate the rest of the abdomen? What are the consequences of rupture of a large ovarian endometrioma? Yes, um, I think this is a, a question or a concern of the patient. 
but we do not know the cause of endometriosis. This is our current problem we still have. So we cannot say the endometriosis comes because of. So what we know is that if we have a patient, for example, diagnosed with fibroids or diagnosed with a malformation like a septum in the uterus, for example, or other malformation affecting the cervix or the uterus or the vagina or as i said we have patients with fibroids with myoma these patients have a higher chance to have simultaneously endometriosis but only because a cyst rupture um, that then you have a higher chance that this and the and the metrium which comes out of the cyst develops on the, at the other side at another area again endometriosis i would say this is there are no data for it but we should be aware that once you have been diagnosed with an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst you have to be aware that you could have at the same time endometriosis at another area and there you have to be very careful but if the cyst ruptured there is not a real higher chance that after i don't know six months you will get again endometriosis the only thing is that once you have endometriosis it could come back but if it comes back because of the rupture there are no data about it thank you very much so there is a, in general, what Professor Baraker mentioned is it is uh, endometrioma when it, it ruptures, you know, uh, there is no data, but I, I do want to let you know that it is a good idea to try to avoid and not let it rupture. And sometimes in some areas, because we see a lot of patients here from so IVF labs that they try to aspirate the endometriomas and when these endometriomas are full of thick blood it's very difficult to aspirate them and the endometrioma ruptures and it causes in our experience has caused a lot of severe pain and sometimes they get infected and becomes abscess and patients they get admitted to the hospital and then they have to receive a lot of antibiotics. So uh, that is uh, tried, not if it is a very large endometrioma, the more experienced the IVF physician is not to rupture it. And if it ruptures right away, you should get to somebody who is very experienced because if it stays there, the blood is a good source for culture and infection, and it should be really cleaned up as soon as possible, in, uh, otherwise it could unfortunately get very worse, and we have seen it many, many times. So the next question is for Dr. Farnejad, that when you remove endometriosis and endometrioma, do the, some, is it normal to feel pressure on your, if endometriosis is removed from your bladder or your bowel, what is normal? pain and what is not normal pain, normal pressure, pain pressure on the bladder, etc. It depends uh, to how deep the endometriosis was on the bladder or different part of the pelvis. Remember after the surgery, the body uh, has a reaction and there is some inflammatory process going on in the pelvis. So some sort of the pressure and discomfort is normal as long as the patient does not have a high fever to be sure there is no infection. That is the reason that we put the patient on anti-inflammatory medication. Not only he takes care of the pain, also decreases the inflammation. Also, occasionally, if the endometriosis on the bladder and certain area or in the posterior cul-de-sac around uterus sacral ligament is very deep, 
and is resected, affects the pelvic nerve. And those nerves could have some effect on the bladder function. And we see frequently after we're doing hysterectomy, patient comes and has some bladder function irregularity and frequently again is confused with bladder infection. It is not infection. And after a few months or a few weeks even, this disappears. Thank you very much, Dr. Farnajad. Dr. Brock, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Bosev and uh, Professor Brocker, they are in Europe and we appreciate very, very much your participation. It is late for you and we thank you and with you, all of your experience, we are very grateful. There is a question for you that uh, uh, Professor Bosev, is it how often after you remove an endometrioma, a large endometrioma is removed? How often after that you should have a post-app ultrasound to make sure the cyst is gone or the ovary is functioning well? How should we monitor post-operatively? In my practice, I usually do my post-operating follow-up on the third month, on the sixth month, and on the 12th month after surgery. So what's what's that's what I do in my practice. Thank you very much, Professor Borsev. The next question is for Professor Brocker. When you do, uh, when is it uh, necessary to do, uh, remove a part of the bladder wall for endometriosis? Well, um as we learn today or what we should learn today is when should endometriosis be totally removed regarding which symptoms so if you have the the problem is what are the symptoms related to and as you said cameron um endometriosis surgery could be much more severe and much more difficult than any oncological surgery because um, endometriosis goes really or could go really deep into other organs like the bladder or like the rectum. So it is very important that before the surgery, you really talk and listen to your patient. What complaints and what symptoms do they have? And what is the main focus? Do they have pain or do they wish to conceive immediately? So you have really to look if, for example, they have severe endometriosis in the bladder, but they have no pain at all, no symptoms regarding the bladder. You have to see how extensive you resect it really because the bladder you will need. So if you have you can remove half of the bladder without, well, having severe problems afterwards. But you have to talk to your patient before really carefully and tell her and really listen to her and ask her what type of problems she really has. And the good thing about minimal invasive surgery is that experienced surgeon can remove the bladder wall and reconstruct the bladder at the same time. You have to see if the endometriosis is close to the ureter, for example, and if you have to do a re-anastomosis of the ureter into the bladder. But these are all things you have to evaluate preoperatively so that you can really talk to the patient what could happen during the surgery and that it could be that you could, there is a need for remove half of the bladder, but that afterwards her symptoms are really relieved and that she could live really with half a bladder afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bracker. Uh, we appreciate your comment. Professor Bracker has done a lot of work for young women, for women who have had congenital abnormalities of their uh, reproductive system that often they have more endometriosis 
and we really appreciate your comment. I do like to let you know that we have a lot of questions and because we have so many questions and there is a lot of interest, we will continue our discussion for half an hour more. We might not be able to answer all the questions, unfortunately, but uh, I'd like to thank our fellows, Dr. Anupama Rambatla and also Dr. Janelle uh, Jackman. They are online. They are also answering some of the questions. And we will try, I will try to combine some of these questions because there is a lot more left. I have only addressed only uh, less than uh, uh, half of the questions. So I would combine some of these questions together to see if we can answer them. And the next question is, uh, and hopefully this question perhaps Dr. Farnejad could ad address it. Where are the origins of endometrioma and how do chocolate cysts form? I do want to let you know Dr. Farnejad developed a theory and he came up with an idea that was proven where endometriomas come from, chocolate cysts. Dr. Farnejad, go ahead and please address that. We appreciate it. Briefly, before I uh, mention about endometrioma, how they are formed, if you look in the pelvic uh, cavity, the only area that we could see large endometriomas are on the ovary. So we looked in a large number of our patients and we classified the endometrioma to two types. We call them type one. They usually are small cysts and when you drain them, when you want to excise them, are very difficult to remove. And we call them type one. And the original of these endometriomas are similar to endometriosis of the peritoneum, the bowel, and the bladder is the same. The second one, which are the most common one, are uh, involvement of this type one endometrioma or superficial endometriosis in the ovarian cortex or the pelvic sidewall, which is attaches to the functional ovarian cyst, mostly corpus luteum. So what happens is endometriosis is in the cortex, interferes with that function of that ovary, and would not allow that corpus luteum that's supposed to be disappeared by the end of the month. Assume the patient is not pregnant, and assume the patient is not on any kind of hormonal suppressive therapy, and this uh, corpus luteum is supposed to disappear by the end of the month, does not. So gradually that endometriosis on the ovary and cortex or when the ovary is attached to the pelvic sidewall penetrates to this ovary and that corpus luteum becomes ductless cyst. And depends the age of that cyst we classify that type 2 to type 1A, type 2A, B, C. That has helped us to manage our patients, not only during the surgery, also post-operatively. A lot of concerns of removal of the endometrioma is decreasing the ovarian function. And removing the endometrioma be very bloody because we fibrotic tissue and when you pull the cyst wall out could bleed and then you have to use uh, diatermy uh, cautery to stop the bleeding so if you excise only that ring around the chocolate cyst the rest of them easily will come out without damaging the ovary also, as I mentioned before, if the endometrioma is removed and you put the patient on the oppressive therapy that patient does not ovulate, I promise you, patient will not develop endometrioma. This has been our experience. 
experience for past more than 30 years. And other people also have published that people that they are on self therapy in normal recurrency are low. Opposite way, if the patient gets stimulated and produces multiple uh, cysts or multiple uh, uh, gluteum like IVF, these people are higher chance for forming endometrium. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul Nejad. Now, there are many questions uh, regarding how to manage postoperatively after the surgery, how to manage the pain, and how to prevent endometriosis from coming back, and how everybody manages that. And as Lily mentioned, it, that she said endometriosis often is associated with other other problems. Patient might have other issues, like this patient. Uh, several patients actually have had questions that besides endometriosis, one of them has PCOS. The other patient, she says, besides endometriosis and PCOS, she has chronic fatigue syndrome. Another patient, she has thyroid disorder and uh, endometriosis. So postoperatively, when this patient, they have pain, how do you manage them? Do you use Mirena or IUD? What is the risk of recurrence of ovarian cysts? Professor Bosse, would you like, how do you manage postoperatively these patients for their pain and how do you, what do you advise them? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Well, first it is important in order to prevent uh, in order to prevent the endometrioma to come back, I think first it is very important how the procedure was done. Was it done by open procedure or laparoscopically? So when you do a paroscopy, you see better, you can treat better, and you can actually uh, treat even small lesions on the surfaces of the ovary and prevent them of getting back to chocolate cyst. Uh, but if the surgery is done precisely, I think that uh, oral contraceptive pills is an option. Is an option because oral contraceptive pills are associated with reduced recurrence rate of dysmenorrhea, pelvic pain, and of course endometrioma. So I think that uh, it's an option for these patients. Thank you very much. I have a question for Professor Brocker. Actually, there are several questions. I combine them together. And these questions are the endometriosis. If we, after you have had surgery, how can we best manage it postoperatively to decrease the, the risk of having another surgery? Is having children uh, like having several children after the uh, surgery, would it help you to have less endometriosis until you go to menopause? Probably having, <laughs> you have to have many children, it depends how old you are to go to menopause. But, or uh, should you uh, go on some kind of medication to avoid you having the risk of recurrence? How can we cut down the risk of recurrence of endometriosis? Yes, as uh, Dr. Vosev just um, said, what is very important is that the surgery is really done precisely, which means that you have to know if you have got removed most or all of the endometriosis lesions. Because after that, if you then put, for example, the patient on an uh, oral contraceptive, um, you have the best chance that endometriosis does not come immediately back. So the most important thing is to look that you remove most of the lesion or especially if you can all the lesion and not just coagulate them but resect them really and remove them. And then it depends, of course, we all want to have many children. This is a good thing. So during you are pregnant, um, you can be assured that normally endometriosis does not come back. 
But of course, if you are 20 in your mid 20, um, and if you wait until menopause um, and be pregnant all the time, not for everybody, this is a good option. But of course, if you are, let's say 25 year old diagnosed with endometriosis, had a good and perfect surgery, and then you take oral contraception for, I, let's say three, four years, normally you're really on a safe side. If you have a real severe endometriosis, you could also put your ovaries for about three months with no function. If you have, for example, an injection, which helps um, to get three months, the ovary no functioning, and then start again back. And we have good experience that then patients really get fertile and pregnant afterwards because then the ovary has slept for a while the endometrium had become yeah quiet as well and if you then start to get pregnant this is a really good time frame and normally patients get immediately pregnant afterwards thank you uh, professor Bracker. there are many questions that uh, perhaps uh, Professor Sinanejad can answer. And that the question is, a lot of patients have chocolate cysts, endometriomas, and they have no other symptoms. And many of these patients, they, want, they are trying to get pregnant. They want to know they have no symptoms, they have only the endometriomas, and the, what what is your experience? And the IVF physician they say, no, it is okay. You don't need to have surgery, and endometrioma could be well. How do you feel, and how do you approach these people? Could it endometriosis be uh, treated and uh, respond? This is a patient exactly like what uh, Marketa was uh, mentioning. It. There are many patients in the shoes of Marketa that they have endometriomas and endometriosis. Some of them don't even have pain. Thank you. This is an excellent question and it comes up very frequently. There are organizations, societies that they don't have a clear answer for it. Like if you read X-ray guideline versus ASRM guideline, they are all based on the statistics. So in my practice, when the patient comes to me, pretty much they have failed everything. So, and I'm a surgical practice, and I know what I can do for the surgery, for the patient. But for this individual, I think Marketa answered all the questions. If you want to be a statistics, then you go by recommendation. Many people go and have IVF, a lot of them get pregnant, a lot of them don't get pregnant because endometrioma and endometriosis is proven to have a toxic effect on the ovary, on the endometrium. It could affect the ovarian response. It could affect the quality of egg. It could prevent from embryo formation and it could affect implantation. All of these or the criteria that needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. The uh, Professor Bracker and Professor, uh, do you have anything to add about uh, endometriomas, endometriosis, when they are asymptomatic on infertility patients? Well, what, what we have learned is that on one hand side, endometriosis is something or could be something like a chronic disease. But what we also have learned is that if you have only a minor lesions seen in the surgery, this could also affect your fertility. So you cannot combine that if you have only a few lesions, there could no effect of in the, the fertility. And if you have a lot of lesions, this affects your fertility. So this is what we have really learned. So if you try to get pregnant via IVF, for example, and have been diagnosed with endometriosis and you have no success, it is worthwhile again do a laparoscopy and look 
even if you have no symptoms, because there could be a few lesions. And if you resect them, your inflammation in your pelvis gets lower. And sometimes these patients really get pregnant via IVF or via natural cycle. So combining that if there are no symptoms, you have no endometriosis is false. You can have endometriosis without having major symptoms. And if you do not get pregnant, it is worth to do again a laparoscopy and look. And if you see lesions, remove them. Thank you very much, Professor Braca. Professor Bozeb, how do you address this question? Well, I think that uh, it is very important to know how the patient wants to conceive. By all means, if the patient wants to conceive naturally, I think the best way to address endometriosis is through laparoscopy and to treat endometriosis laparoscopically because it increases the chances to get pregnant naturally. And I think that uh, it is important to note that even, even there are small cysts, the endometriosis is invasive disease and it goes gradually and by laparoscopy you can restructure the anatomy and conceive naturally. I think that's the biggest advantage of laparoscopy. And the other thing is that with laparoscopy, as I said before, you see better, you treat better. That's the real advantage of laparoscopy for the surgeon and for the patient. Thank you, Professor Bosa. And how about you, Professor Parnija? How do you approach them? I agree 100% what it was said, that in our opinion, any infertility patient that has other cause of infertility has been ruled out, has to have laparoscopy, and any endometriosis has to be resected. As Professor Barker said, the pathophysiology is very simple. The endometriosis is an inflammatory process. And when you resect the endometriosis, it decreases the inflammation. That is the reason that most of the patients who get pregnant immediately. The endometrioma is part of the, the whole scenario. I've hardly ever seen in my practice that patient had purely endometrioma. Even two centimeters, three centimeters, this endometrioma are not by themselves. It's endometriosis somewhere else. And if it is resected, the patient will get better, pregnant, spontaneously, or with IVF, as it was published by Cameron uh, several years ago. And I see in our practice frequently that patients had failed IVF and has come for surgery. Interestingly, some of these patients, when they come back for six weeks checkup, they are pregnant on their own. And I have seen it numerous times. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Pawanija. The issue is, in a lot of the question that came across um, is in respect to endometriomas, chocolate cysts, their management, how to be done in respect to infertility patient, in respect to pain patient. Every single patient has to be individualized. We tried to answer these questions in general, but each of you have to see somebody, a physician who is known, he knows how to manage endometriosis. In case of endometriomas, we, and also endometriosis, and women who try to get pregnant and have no other symptoms except small or sometimes larger endometriomas, it is not alone, as Dr. Farnish has said. Endometriosis, if it is treated thoroughly, especially in younger women, and 
if the husband's sperm is normal, the chance of pregnancy is excellent. As in the younger age group, according to our own papers and our own data that you can scan it, it is on this barcode on my slide, the pregnancy rate on the younger patient uh, that the, the husband's sperm is normal is actually better than IVF in our hands, in our way, for sure. And if the woman is older, and she has failed IVF, and she is no reason infertility, she is still could have endometriosis, and she could still get treated, and her chance of getting pregnant by repeat IVF, in our experience, is much, much better than going ahead and just uh, keep doing IVF. So that is our experience. And to diagnose endometriosis, there are some tests coming up, like receptiva tests, endometrial receptive te uh, receptiva tests. These are other tests are coming up. Also, Worldwide Endomarch has developed an app that it is free. You can do that test. The, the other tests are you, can, you have to pay uh, some money, but this one is free. Free. You can be diagnosed and your endometriosis, if treated properly, you could have a better chance of getting pregnant. So in summary, uh, the care of endometrioma should be individualized, and you should see proper physician for your management. For endometriosis of the bladder and ureter, and even the bowel, an expert could manage and help you. There are guidelines. There are published uh, papers, and i like to thank enormously Professor Bosa, Professor Brucker, and uh, Miss Lily and uh, Cooper, and her mom Karen, and Marquetta, and Stella, and Ryan, and also all, the, all of you, the listeners, and also participants around the world for the expertise for your interest and we look forward to seeing you all next month and send us your question as i mentioned next month would be about um, adenomyosis endometriosis and myoma of the uterus and their relationship send all of the, your questions and i would be happy to answer them meanwhile you all stay safe and we say goodbye to all of you thank you very much again